This is Soundstage founder Doug Schneider. You're listening to the Soundstage Audiophile Podcast, your semi-regular deep dive into news, facts, opinions, and anecdotes about everything that really matters in the world of high-performance audio. Hosts Brent Butterworth and Dennis Berger have more than five decades worth of audio product testing experience and a few hours of podcasting experience as well. Now, here's Brent and Dennis. Hello, I'm Brent Butterworth, editor of Soundstage Solo. And I'm Dennis Berger, editor of Soundstage Access. And this is the Soundstage Audiophile Podcast. Wait, what's Soundstage, Brent? Soundstage is a collection of nine microsites available at soundstage.com that deals with every aspect of audio you can pretty much imagine from really low end, you know, maybe. $14, $15 $14, $15 earphones and Bluetooth speakers, all the way up to half million dollar audio systems. Is that what we're talking about this week, I assume? We're talking about all kinds of stuff this week. So first, we're going to talk about a review that's on audiophilia.com, and it's of the Ansu's Acoustics Sorts, which are a little RCA termination plug that goes into the back of your preamp or integrated amp or whatever and supposedly reduces noise. And we've seen these things before from Cardis and a lot of generic versions, but this one is getting into the range, depending on which model you get, of about a thousand bucks a plug. Mm-hmm. So we are going to you know kind of look at that and talk about what those kind of products do, what they claim they do, what they really can do, et cetera, et cetera. And do you have a story for us this week? I do. There's something cool I saw on um, Soundstage Australia. Actually, you sent me this story about Australian manufacturer Pitt & Gimlin's new Dynamic Duo. A couple of really cool speakers, uh, Tasmanian speakers, uh, apparently. <laughs> yeah, they are Ooh. super f- funky looking, super cool looking, but... Perhaps the most interesting thing about them is that they use Hypex in-core uh, plate amps in them. You don't hook an amp to these things. They've got their own amplification. They're active. Um, and, you know, that plays right into a cool recent video from uh, John Darko uh, about sort of the future of hi-fi, future fi, he's calling it, and, and how active loudspeakers fit into that. So I think there's probably a cool conversation you and I could have about that because it's a topic we've we've dug into quite a bit. Um, Excellent. Anyway, yeah, what, what do you want to wrap things up with this week? And we're going to wrap this up with an article that's by Jeff Fritz, who is our editor-in-chief of all of the Soundstage sites, but in particular, he is the editor of the Soundstage Ultra site, which deals with super high-end gear. And he did an article called What Happened to Avalon Acoustics, which was a super, super hot speaker manufacturer of, I don't know, probably 20 years ago, that I guess is still around. And readers were asking what happened to it. But it was a really interesting discussion in his article about how people get samples in for review and what they consider when they're reviewing, you know, what, what they consider when when they were they choose review samples, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot for us to dig into there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got a lot to dig into this week, but let's start with the kooky stuff, man. <laughs> well, but, but you're, you're prejudging here. I am you're prejudging. You should, well, you should it's keep a, an open mind. It's not that I'm prejudging. It's just that I've already judged. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so you should keep an open mind because that allows people to fill it full of. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So anyway, this article is from uh, Audiophilia, which is a site, audiophilia.com, which is a site that I read a lot because uh, uh, Anthony, the guy who runs it, has the, in my opinion, kind of the best classical reviews, along with Jason Victor Serenus of Stereophile. Really, really, really solid classical reviews and, and reviews of a lot of sort of uh, exotic gear that I, I might not normally take a look at. And so anyway, I, I saw a review there of the ANSUs, that's A-N-S-U-Z, Acoustics Sorts, which are, it looks like it's about an inch and a half, two inches long, and it's like, it's like an RCA connector. And you plug it into the back. The idea is you plug it into the back of your preamp, into an open input that you're not using. Like, let's say you have four inputs on your four analog inputs on your preamp, and you're only using two or three, and so you plug this into one of the open ones. And the idea is that it. Well, let me let me just read from what they said here. Okay, so it says as a termination plug for open input and output sockets. Oh, it's for the outputs too. 
Mm. This innovative audio product has been designed to audibly reduce disturbing noise that infiltrates any audio component through the open input-output sockets or through the ground connection. Okay. And mm-hmm. later on, they talk about how it's, uh, it's, it's mainly blocking RF noise, radio frequency. And we've discussed radio frequency noise in the past mm-hmm. uh, as, as something that could be a problem, but in many cases is a sort of phantom menace. And I, I just have to point out here, you know, they're talking about, you know, RF noise leaking into the ground and, and, and stuff like that. And to me, that's like one of that's one of the greatest hits of high-end audio marketing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the hey. free bird of high-end audio marketing. <laughs> and let me ask let me ask you a question real quick, because we yes. as you mentioned, we we discussed RF interference on a previous episode, episode yeah. four, actually, if people want to go back and listen to it. And we I think touched upon something that people could 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 come back and say, aha, got you, right? Um, something that you said. And I, I want to okay. sort of, before we before we dig into this conversation, I want to play this clip from what you said in episode four and sort of get you to respond to that and explain how that relates to a solution like this. So here is what you said. Okay. There's these ground boxes that come out that ground all the components of your system. And, you know, maybe there's something to that, like Nordos has one and, that that could solve certain problems. It could introduce more problems too, but it might help. All right. So okay. obviously so, you're just changing on a dime here, Brent. I'm, no. I'm not. <laughs> RF, okay. So like RF is not nothing. It's not yeah. impossible for RF, you know, radio frequency coming in through whatever. And radio frequency can come from actual radio waves. It can come from, uh, you know, your appliances because radio frequencies are much higher than audio frequencies. And when your appliances throw off electrical spikes and things like that, those are very, very fast. And the frequencies of of those spikes and things like that and the noise that that these kind of components throw off and these kind of components also include the switching power supplies that are in all your computers and most of your electrical gear these days. Um, it can throw off radio frequency noise back into your AC lines, or it can just radiate the radio frequency noise out into the air, along with, you know, whatever your KABC TV station is and your radio station and all that sort of thing. And your neighbor's, what, you know, your neighbor's cell phone. But as we've discussed, you know, radio frequency noise is, is largely ignored by audio systems. Uh, unless you have an audio system that's working at radio frequency, like a digital audio system there's you know analog audio systems basically all have some kind of filtering that's going to get rid of any kind of radio frequency noise whether it's filtering in the amplifier or it's filtering in the speaker itself so anyway these plugs go into the back of your preamp or whatever and they go into the open socket so they go into an input you're not using so let's say you're using a a a streamer right a streamer or a dac right a dac with a streamer and that's on input one and you have maybe a tape deck on input two. Input three's open. So you plug this thing into input three and supposedly it gets rid of radio frequency noise because the idea is that these open inputs are basically serving as an antenna. Because mm-hmm. what's an antenna? An antenna is basically, if you think of like a, a shielded piece of cable, right? With mm-hmm. a center conductor and then a shield around it that protects that protects the, the center conductor from all this radio frequency stuff. When you strip away, when you just leave the center conductor and you strip away the shield, that's effectively an antenna. Mm, yeah. And so what they're saying is since these, these inputs are not terminated, since it's just an, a, an open input on the end of your RCA plug, that it's going to somehow, you know, be an antenna for radio frequency. The problem here is this. Um, if you think of, think of like the simplest possible input selector, right? And the way, the best way to think about this is, um, for the listening audience right now, take your left hand and point the fingers of your left hand directly at your face, right? And Mm -hmm. curve them, you know, so it's like you're holding a a baseball or something, right? Mm -hmm. And then take your right hand and take your index finger and point at each of your fingers. That's how the, the simplest of input selectors works, but it's only connected to one of those inputs at a time. Yeah. Okay. So signal can come in. I mean, I think if you, you know, if you, you know, move your, uh, if you have a couple different inputs on your preamp, you know, if you 
let's say you turn off in, whatever the source is on input one, you turn it off and you leave input two playing. Do you hear input two leaking through input one? Maybe if it's a really bad, yeah. super cheap, <laughs> I mean, really bad components. Yeah. A really bad component. I remember when I was a kid, you know, some of the really junky stuff that I had kicking around might do that a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I, I haven't heard that in, in, in a long, long time. So the, the premise is, first of all, all this RF is coming in through the center pin of that open RCA jack. And then it's somehow getting to the input selector. And the input selector can be a physical knob. It can be uh, most hiring components use relays nowadays. Um, or it can actually just be an uh, electronic switching on the circuit board. But it's separate. And so... The signals coming in, yeah, yeah, so maybe RF signals are coming in, but then they don't connect to anything. And they can leak across a little bit, but we're talking about, you know, minus 80, minus 90 dB from input to input. It's something that people just don't even bother measuring with amplifiers and preamps usually because it's just not a problem. Um, As opposed to crosstalk between channels, which, you know, can be a little bit of a problem with Mm -hmm. with you know amplifiers and preamps almost almost never but you know know, it's uh, significant enough that we do measure it it's significant enough that we do measure it but we don't measure the leakage from input two into input one when you're using input one and your and input two is not terminated (laughs) yeah so Anyway, so these these devices have a couple of Tesla coils in them, and I'm going to be you. You probably know better what a Tesla coil is than I do. I don't really know. Well, I I don't. The Tesla coil that most people would think of is 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 probably not exactly what they're talking about here. But basically, it's just it's two coils of wire, one of them running clockwise, the other one running anti clockwise. So it cancels. You know. Yeah, so it cancels out. Any, yeah. any, any noise that hits them is going to be canceled, just as it would with right. a balanced microphone connection. Right, right, Which is right. why you have balanced cables for, for long microphone runs. Yeah, or yeah. Any, any microphone one in, in a professional setting. Yeah. So anyway, so these things have two Tesla coils in them. And so they are, I guess, supposedly sort of, I mean, obviously, you, 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 I guess they're blocking off the, the input of the RCA jack and it has these Tesla coils that supposedly soak up something. Yeah. And, but again, and I, I should also point out that, yeah, you do have an open pin there on the RCA jack, but even if it were connected, the rest of the component is shielded, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, what, name an audio component that doesn't have a metal chassis, right? Yeah. I, I can't think of one. These and they are, no. they are not the shielding isn't perfect. I mean, a lot of these things have ventilation in them. I mean, almost everything has some kind of ventilation, um, but it's close enough. And so the little teeny, tiny, tiny amount of RF that might leak in through the jack there, that little teeny, tiny area that, uh, that's not shielded is then going to go down some kind of a wire, some kind of a, a circuit board trace or whatever, and it's going to get to a dead end. It's going to get to nothing. And so I guess the idea is that it somehow radiates across. Anyway, I, it's just sort of like they haven't really made a case. And if you look at the language on this, I'm, I'm a little bothered by the language on here. There's there's one piece of language that really, really bothers me the worst. So let me okay. go, to, go first on this and then, then we'll dig into yours. So but, uh, in the in the course of this review, he's talking about Lars Christensen and, and mm-hmm. Christensen believes that we are at only... 20% of heard musical information, the other unheard 80% hindered by topology and physics. Now, the question I have is, what does he mean by topology in that case? I mean, topology could mean a few different things. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, it's whether you're talking about material sciences, geometry, or audio, you know, the topology of an amplifier, which a lot of times we sort of would just describe as the architecture, what have you. But like, what do you think he means by topology in this case? I, I guess just the, I, I just don't know. I mean, I, it could be this. I mean, when I think of topology, I think of a circuit board layout and an amplifier, right? Yeah. yeah. And, that's normally what we're talking about, but there's lots of different topologies for circuit boards and amplifiers and preamps and everything else. Mm-hmm. And 
And, you know, if the designer is free to, if the topology is not working, if the topology is somehow losing all this information, well, change the topology. I mean, how, how hard is it to do unless you need to do it in four dimensions or something? Maybe that's it. That's always my problem with stuff like this is you always run into something where it's like, but wait, what are you talking about? Like, what do you actually, you, you, you get to into, you know, in ego Mentoya territory where it's like, I do, I do not think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> it's, it's, what is it? What is it in this case? And why can't he spell it out clearly? There's always the problem of taking very, very complicated things and oversimplifying them and then taking very simple things and over complicating them yeah and what is, to the and point what is to that? where there's yeah you know, we can't communicate anymore because we're just we're not using language the same but we're supposed to just accept these words mean something even though we don't nobody really knows what they mean that's where i get mad yeah so i, I have a big problem with a different part of that sentence and that's it you know christensen believes we are at only 20 percent of heard musical information well what does that mean okay does that mean we're not hearing all the bandwidth? Well, I would say no, because having done a lot of recording, having analyzed my recordings, playing an acoustical instrument every day of my life, and often you know on a semi-pro level, and doing recordings and all that sort of thing, and being around other acoustical instruments and all that sort of thing, the, the recorded look, it, the recorded process is not inherently superior to or worse than a live performance. It's just different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a painting of someone versus a photograph. What's better? I don't know. So it's, and, and what does that mean? 20%. So like, if you listen to a Charlie Parker album and, and he's doing, and you know, Charlie Parker could play <laughs> a full chord arpeggio within one, you know, one beat. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> which, you know, four notes typically so um are, are we saying that charlie parker could work you know instead of one arpeggio into one beat could work five it's just what is her musical information and but here's what bothers me is that this is a a sort of a, a quasi mystical approach that like yeah. oh you know today's audio systems yeah they just don't even come close to you know real music and this is something that a lot of, if we see this repeated all the time in high-end audio, and we've seen plenty of articles where like, oh yeah, people, you know, today's, you know, recording and reproduction, it's just, it's just still so bad. It's still so far from the real music. And so therefore, it's, to, in my view, in my, yeah, you know, this may be a sincerely held belief. I don't know. If it's a sincerely held belief, it's baseless. Now, number two, as far as I can see, in, in other words, if it's not baseless, explain the base to me. OK, but second of all, this is a really handy thing to do to sell gear because you can say, oh, you know, we just have so far to go to get to the musical experience to get to the, the real, you know, whatever. And so if you spend another 10,000 bucks, you might get to 21 <laughs> percent. Yeah. And also, I, by the way, I mean, here's another thing. I went to the website, the, the audio group Denmark dot com website mm -hmm. and looked at this product and and I, I really wanted to see the specifications because i thought maybe maybe there's a chance i mean look what they're claiming here is that this thing reduces noise and distortion right mm -hmm. so a reduction of noise and distortion could be measured you would think maybe they would tell you we reduce yep. thd plus n by i don't know three quarters of a percent or something like yeah, that. Or the only specifications they list on their website are the diameter and length of the unit, which is a uh, 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 half an inch by two and three quarters inches. That's it. Oh. Those are your technical specifications, half an inch by two and three quarters inches. And they tell you nothing else in terms of specs about what this thing does I mean, you list the materials of the of the different pieces. Oh, one's got tungsten and one's, you know, cryogenically, blah, 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 whatever. One's got zirconium top coat. The other one is a supreme yeah. coating, whatever that means. But uh, this doesn't really say anything. Well, and look, if you're if you're filtering RF, OK, mm -hmm. everybody listening, if someone says they're filtering RF, it costs about fifty dollars to measure that. Okay, you can go buy. I bought one. It's a little, uh, a funky little box I bought off Amazon, and you can plug it into your computer. First of all, you, it's got its own little tiny screen. I wish I could remember what it's called. Uh, it's like a mini, 
uh, uh, mini spectrum analyzer or something like that. Mini S, mm. I can't remember. But um, I've paid 50 bucks for it or thereabouts on Amazon and it connects to my computer. I use it, that's what I use for uh, when I test TV antennas. Okay. And so, uh, gee whiz, it'll test TV antennas, which that's pretty high frequency. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know you could go buy this thing for fifty bucks, and yeah. you could give us a spec of here is how much RF this thing reduces at fifty megahertz or something. Mm-hmm. If a if an idiot like me, whose knowledge of RF is is well way better than average, but still nowhere near you know engineer level, uh, if I can do this for fifty bucks, I mean come on, give us a spec of what this thing does, and, and you know, and if you're saying it's audible, I mean you're, they're saying it's designed to be audible, mm-hmm. not that it is audible, and you know, I could grab a couple of pieces of, of driftwood and like glue them together with a, a, a glue gun and say that it's a, an acoustical device designed to be audible. Which is true. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't mm. mean it's audible. So if, you, but you know, you can prove if you have RF filtering, put it put it in the spec because you can do it for fifty bucks. And if you if your device has audible effects, prove it. Just do a double blind test and and say, hey, you know what? We tested this thing and we had, you know, just do it like like an AES paper and say, hey, we had 20 listeners or we had 50 listeners or we had three listeners, whatever turned you on and say, hey, we found that in this percentage of cases, it produced an audible improvement in these blind tests. This is not hard. It's not expensive. And if people, my attitude is if people aren't doing this, then there's some sort of mumbo jumbo in there and they don't, they may not really know the efficacy of their own product. Yeah. You know, the thing is, Uh, Have you ever read um, Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World? You know I haven't. Okay, you need to read Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World. You would love this book, but there's this really great section in it that is what Carl Sagan called his baloney detection toolkit, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And it was really sort of more of a way to just analyze claims and and recognize the likelihood that what you're being fed is a, is a line of BS, right? Mm-hmm. I, we need something like that for audio. You and I need to get together and author Maybe an should. audiophile baloney detection toolkit. Yeah. And now, and again, I, I, as, as I think we said before, I don't care if people want to go spend a thousand bucks on some doohickey for their audio system. I do that too. Okay. Mm-hmm. Maybe not a thousand. But I would prefer, I would always look, I mean, I just bought some new, I needed a new set of RCA cables because I, I, I just moved as I think we've said, and I've lost some stuff and I, I've still got a bunch of boxes. I can't find anything. So I thought, you know, I'll just buy some off Amazon. And did I buy the cheapest ones? No, I bought some ones that looked like really well-made and very cool. And I think I spent 30 bucks a pair. Yeah. And now they do look incredibly cool and they're like kind of lime green. So oh, yeah. But yeah, so so we all look look we're we're consumers, man. That's what consumerism is about, and audio is is a consumer thing. I so use a I, lot of um, straight wire interconnects. Yeah. They've got that diamond pattern on the casing. They're well made cables. Yeah, Don't get me wrong, well but made. it's like they look super rad, dude. They just look awesome nothing so, wrong with yeah, that but nothing wrong I, with that at all i and i don't want to disparage this company because they also make speakers that look really nice with like ribbon tweeters and they look like they're really well made and i don't look at the, i look at the design i'm going yeah that could work um yeah. and they make some also some you know power distribution products and that's all fine but in this case i look at this thing going you know what explain to me what it give me a no nonsense explanation of what it does show me mm-hmm. measurements show me listening tests you know if your product really works you can do that stuff yeah okay and yeah. it's not if an idiot like me can do it anybody can do it well not anybody <laughs> <laughs> Let's wrap this up before okay. we start telling people to get off our lawn. Uh, we'll, we're going to take a little break here and uh, listen to some pretty music. And awesome. uh, yeah, we'll be back in just a minute.
and welcome back to the Soundstage Audiophile Podcast. I'm Dennis Berger. And I am Brent Butterworth. <laughs> and in this segment, we're going to be talking about two pieces that might not seem to be super related at first, but kind of both play into a trend that that I, at least I'm excited about. And, and I think you have some thoughts on too, Brent. There mm-hmm. is um, there's a piece on Soundstage Australia um, about uh, two s- new speakers from a um, Tasmanian company called Pitt and Giblin. Mm-hmm. Um, really, really interesting speakers called the Super Wax Benny and the Super Wax. Um, super traditional looking speakers, kind of funky, weird looking, the kind of speakers that you would expect to see like a flea watt tube amplifier sitting between them. And yet yeah. they, 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 they are not that. These are like the things that like if you walk past a room at an audio show and you you poked in your head in the door and saw these playing, you'd have to sit down and listen to them. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. We should say to uh, uh, Soundstage Australia is, uh, you know, one of one of the, the many little microsites that belong to the Soundstage Network. It's a regional site that's covering a lot of the cool stuff going on in sort of Australian hi-fi. But a lot of stuff that uh, that they talk about is applicable worldwide. But these yeah. these are Tasmanians. So. Um, and we're, we should say we're lucky enough to have uh, the editor of Soundstage Australia is Edgar Kramer, who is, mm-hmm. you know, Australia has its own high end audio scene and has for for decades. And he is one of the real sort of star, maybe the star writer from from that scene. So he posts. God, he posts as much content as anybody else on Soundstage, maybe more. And he's really got his finger on the pulse of not only what's going on there, but of course in Australia they get all they get the you know, the B and Ws and the the uh the the Dan D'Agostinos and the Mark Levinsons and all those kind of big brands down there. And he writes about those as well as their local brands. And so this is a local brand. And yeah. so it's uh just even though even if you're not from if you're, if you're one of those people who's not from australia <laughs> um, one of those soundstage australia is definitely worth reading because he has a, a lot of really interesting insights in i mean he's a veteran he's you know like he's been around forever and mm-hmm. he's got a lot of really great insight into the high-end audio world so let's paint a work picture here because these speakers okay. these uh pitt and giblin speakers Really, really neat looking. And one of the things I think that the first thing that grabs your eye is they have this gigantic, solid cast bronze waveguide that is Mm -hmm. uh, it's cast and polished. And it just it looks like it looks steampunk. It looks just gritty and grungy and organic and earthy. And it's just it looks quite unlike, you know, what you would normally think of as a speaker. And then they've got these big cabinets with the, you know, birch uh, cabinets and gigantic cones. And I think they're like paper cones or something yeah. like that. I mean, they look like they look like just sort of just funky. Well, I'll tell you what they look like to me. They look like somebody's taken uh, <laughs> speakers designed for a movie theater and put them in their house. To well, there's, to, there's, which, a, there's a know. lot of truth to that because that's yeah. kind of they are designed along the same lines as like the JBL speakers that you see in movie theaters with a mm-hmm. you know compression driver with a and you know that brass thing is a big as a horn and mm-hmm. uh, and they have these like really kind of low mass uh, big woofers which don't have which don't have that sluggish. You know, blah, blah, blah sound that a lot of uh, uh, sort of higher mass, high excursion woofers have. But what's really, I mean, so there's, you know, some unusual looking funky speakers. I mean, there's lots of those in the business. What's special about these? Well, you turn these things around and they're active. Um, you don't connect an amp to these speakers. They have an, a Hypex Encore plate amp stuck in the back, which I've talked about Hypex Encore a good bit recently on on soundstage access it's a uh, uh, hypex is this company that's making these amp modules and a lot of companies are starting to adopt them nad is using a lot of hypex in core stuff um i just finished reviewing a cambridge audio all-in-one player that uses the hypex in core it's just really they're really really cool class d amps they sound incredible they're just like there is no perceptible noise to them so you get this really clean clear signal but it's there's a little bit of seeming incongruity here to see these funky weird wild looking grungy speakers and then it's got sort of the latest cutting edge active amplification built in 
I don't know, man. I, I it's you know, we we always talk about how there's there's room for all sorts of exploration mm -hmm. in, in our hobby, but I I really think if our hobby is gonna thrive, stuff like this has to be the core of the future. Because this this takes unnecessary complication out of the process. And this gives you look, I would say we get all kinds of email. This is something that I'm having to get used to. Other publications I've never got reader email. At Soundstage, I get a lot of email because our readers mm -hmm. are very, very passionate and they're a very, very cool group. But I'm constantly getting these emails from people going, Hey, I've got these speakers. What amp should I put with it? Or hey, I got this amp. What speaker should I use with it? Well, man, something like this takes that out of the equation. <laughs> you know, the amplification in this is just custom is, is customized to this driver. The, the the speaker was put together knowing the capabilities of that amplification. You don't have to worry about it. So yeah, even if so, you want some funky stuff, it, this is cutting edge funky stuff. Yeah. So, so to me, this is a real, this is a groundbreaking product. And you you wouldn't necessarily think about that. Normally, it'd just be another unusual speaker. But in this case, it's taking, instead of pairing this unusual speaker with some wacky uh, uh, tube amp, you're using state-of-the-art amplification built in. So you can't even use an external amplifier. So it's assumed that whoever buys this will buy a, a streaming device of some sort and connect it and or a phono pre and a, who knows what but you're you're it's a, it's really a different to me this is a giant leap in 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 i think what we can expect to see audio you know the more exotic super high-end uh audio products what what they're going to evolve to and this actually plays into a video that we had briefly mentioned in the beginning from john darko at darko.audio and uh not dot com dot audio and yeah. um you can check it out and it's called uh is this the future of hi-fi i think it might be mm -hmm. and um he talks a lot about like uh uh active speakers like this one not not as unusual as this one but things like the kef ls60 etc which are you know he's saying like look this is this is something that's a lot simpler this is something that's potentially better than having mm -hmm. a separate amplifier and it's it's more affordable often and mm -hmm. it's something and you don't have a whole bunch of cables flying all over the place and you maybe you don't even need to have an equipment rack mm -hmm. and this is because a lot of these speakers have have streaming built in, like the Kefs have have streaming built in. You really don't need to hook anything up to them, and yeah. I think that he's right. And I look, there's there's always going to be people that want to buy separate speakers and amps, and mm -hmm. just in the same way that there are still people that build their own computers, and um, and people that that you know build their own bicycles and things like that right but mm -hmm. i i think john is completely right here and and the fact that that edgar is featuring this this really 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 exotic speaker that's going in the same direction just shows me that i i think that i have to wonder you know i mean look amps are never gonna die but are amps kind of dead <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know if they're dead i just think that they are unnecessary and there's a distinction to be made there. Well, let's because say, uh, can once, we say optional? Yeah, optional. Okay. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. Okay. And you know, that very fact, there are people who are going to be resistant to that. And I want to make sure not to paint them with the same brush because I think mm -hmm. they fall into two categories. There is there is the category of, of enthusiasts that you're talking about that they just love the stuff, man. They love amplifiers yeah. and they're always going to want an amplifier. There are other people, and I hope they're, much less common, but you know, you and I run into them quite frequently on Facebook in conversations. They want this to be more exclusionary. They get they get angry with you and me because we're trying to reach a larger audience. And I think those people are going to reject that because of this. But I think, you know, if we can agree that we do want to reach a larger audience to keep this hobby vibrant, thriving, and growing. Stuff like this is necessary, in my opinion. I think yeah. it's the only thing that's truly going to grow our hobby. And once you get them hooked, well, yeah, then they can start piddling around. But if you tell the completely uninitiated, you need all of this, you need this component, this, this, that, and the other thing, well, a lot fewer people are going to get into it. And that is that is a shame, in my opinion. But yeah, but you're, you're, you're kind of uh, suspiciously evading the real question here. Uh-oh. 
The real question is, when will we see a tube active loudspeaker? <laughs> God, you know this is coming. Wow. Man, I'm trying to think of who the who the target audience for that would be. Uh, you could pop the tubes in the top of it. I mean, technically, we sort of have seen this because, you know, Samsung has put tubes. Oh, yeah. They didn't really do anything or much of anything. They've put tubes in like their wireless speakers and sound bars just sound for bars. show. Yeah. Really? Yeah. But so I have one of those wireless done. speakers. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's true. And so... So it, it's already been done. So it could happen. I mean, maybe they'll just have like a little window with a little preamp tube that kind of glows and has a little blue LED light on it to make it show better. And mm-hmm. but I, I think that somebody's going to do this, especially oh, yeah. after the after the the millions of people who listen to this podcast are going to, you know, so many of them. <laughs> this is going to be like the the Velvet Underground and Nico album, where you know. <laughs> 30,000 people bought it and every one of them started a band. (laughs) So, uh, yeah. So all these manufacturers are listening to this and they're all going to go, yeah, tube, a tube active loudspeaker. Get right on that. Oh man. (laughs) I'm kind of surprised Macintosh hasn't done it already because it's actually kind of a good idea. I don't think they're listening to our podcast anymore. Uh, Definitely not after the last episode. They're not. (laughs) We were nice. Come on. Well, you were nice, right. but you're 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 cuddlier than I am. But why, anyway. am I, why am I nicer, but also wackier? I don't get that's it. A, that's a good question. I'm but like why should clown. I be the one who has the answer to that question? I'm like the benevolent clown. Um, <laughs> so anyway, we should wrap this segment up and move on. And let's segue into yet another musical cut by my good friend, Terry Landry. Let's do it. Brent Butterworth. And I'm Dennis Berger. And so we're going to finish with a story that appeared in Soundstage Ultra by Jeff Fritz, our editor-in-chief. And it's called The Curious Case of Avalon Acoustics. And Dennis, do you know who Avalon Acoustics is? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I vaguely, I think I remember hearing some of their products at CES maybe a decade ago or something like that but I'm not super familiar with them. Yeah, so it's a high-end speaker company, and they were kind of really big, oh gosh, 20, 25 years ago. They would they would be one of the speakers that you'd see the most raved about in, in high-end audio publications. I remember I went to uh, Jonathan Skull's house. He Jonathan used to be a, a writer for Stereophile, and now he's a PR guy, but he, just one of the most delightful people I've ever met. And... And, but but he was really into super kooky tweak products and stuff like that. I think his preamp he had six separate components just for the preamp. And um, whoa! So just to explain, dual mono power supplies, dual mono preamps, and dual mono phono pre's. So he had Avalons, and so you know I wanted to go hear them, and I was pretty floored. He had like one set that was mind blowing. He had one set that was you know good. Um, so anyway, I was kind of, but I had forgotten all about Avalon. And so Jeff is pointing out that he, he had just published a, uh, an article called the best loudspeaker brands for both luxury and performance, the definitive list. Um, that's dangerous, but anyway, um, the brand, well, you know, it's, it's effective too. <laughs> it's effective. And, you know, I, I honestly, Go to the go to Soundstage Ultra and look at Jeff's listening room. I mean, he is super ultra mega hardcore. He's really serious, yeah. and he's been doing this for twenty some odd years. So, yeah. If anybody one knows, I mean, he's a good authority on this. One of the things I keep pointing out in my articles, though, is just like God, 
headline server purpose. Headlines are these days, you know, where we are in journalism, headlines are designed to get you to click on the article. Of That's course. it. And, you yeah. know, <laughs> end of story. So in that respect, yeah. this is a great headline. So the brands he listed were Magico, Rockport, Sonus Faber, and Tidal Audio. That's Tidal Audio speakers, not Tidal, the streaming service. Uh, and right. he also gave uh, uh, sort of uh, honorable mentions to Gubel High End and Estelon. And uh, a reader wrote in to say, why didn't you mention Avalon? And Jeff was kind of like, uh, I didn't even think about him. And, you know, he, he, he <laughs> yeah. mentions, though, he visited Avalon in 2003 and he, you know, that back when they were kind of hot and you know he really liked what he heard but then in 2011 uh you know but they didn't really have a lot of contact with him in, in 2011 avalon appeared at ces and uh doug schneider who's our our founder guiding light wrote an article called awful avalon <laughs> talking about headlines again <laughs> That's a headline for sure. Yeah, that was talking about an Avalon speaker he heard at CES that was, uh, and it retails for fifteen thousand a pair. And he said it didn't even sound like fifteen hundred a pair. Mm. And so now, but that now you get into well, why have we not covered them? And Jeff kind of looks at it from every different angle, and he talks about you know a lot of readers will if you don't cover a product, readers will assume it's because they're not advertising with you, yeah. and. I'm going to tell you, you know, having worked on, you know, marketing consulting, having worked for Dolby for a while and being in the press, I can tell you there are publications where your advertising buys you editorial. However, mm -hmm. not many. I could name a couple mm -hmm. and but but not many. And. With I've had it happen to me a few times, but yeah, it's okay. It's, sure, it's it happens, it. but it doesn't happen with Soundstage. It doesn't happen with you know Stereophile. It doesn't happen with people like John Darko. You know, the vast majority of the publications that you read don't do that kind of thing. Right um, now, granted, if you're advertising with them, you're probably going to have more contact with them, and you might get more reviews just because you have more contact with them. But well, just because you're more likely to say, "Hey, we've got this new thing. Do you want to check it out?" Yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. You, if you, you have a working relationship with someone like that, you're going to go, "Hey, it's a new thing. You want it?" And you could say, "Yeah" or "No." I mean, yeah. But Jeff points out that you know, look, there there are lots of people who don't advertise with us that get uh, that get reviews, and you you know, you can look at at Soundstage Solo, which I edit, which is the headphone site, and you know, headphone manufacturers are notorious for not advertising, and there are very few of them that I review that actually advertise with us. So. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, he starts to talk about how, you know, he'd be happy to review these things. And I, I think it, they, they just weren't even on his radar. And that's a good thing to, to point out is that a lot of manufacturers kind of, kind of ebb and flow. And sometimes they, they kind of disappear for a while and it depends on who's running the company. It depends on how well they're doing. If they're having a couple bad years, they're probably not going to do a big splash at, at Munich or something. And, or, and they may not have the PR budget or they may have had a great PR person that left or got booted out or something like that. And maybe whoever took their place is not a good PR person. Um, you know, I mean, a, a great example is, is Sandy Gross who used to run golden ear and, definitive technology and yeah. you know sandy was always his own pr guy and yeah. he was one of the best in the world he was great at it and so you know golden ear doesn't have sandy anymore because he yeah. sold the company and what are they doing now i don't know yeah me either and it's a shame because you know they were one of my favorite modern speaker brands so yeah whereas definitive is owned by uh Sound United. Sound United. That's right. And Sound United has <laughs> has had a pretty good run of having pretty great PR people. And yeah. Yeah, I can kind of tell you what Definitive's up to. So a, a lot of this is just because, you know, companies kind of, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, look, you can have companies like, like, let's say B&W, right? Bowers and Wilkins. They are, they have been consistent for 30 years for as long as i can remember they had a consistent they consistently developed new product 
They consistently made noise about it. They consistently appeared at hi-fi shows. And so they have always been on everybody's radar. And so we should be clear. We're not saying Bowers and Wilkins has only been around for 30 years. Yes, they were founded in some year or another. You can go to Wikipedia and look that up if you want. We're not saying they've only been around for 30 years. Shout out to whatever reader that was. No, listener, listener. So we have listeners now. Wow. We do have listeners. Yeah. (laughs) Welcome to the future. Um, so, <laughs> oh, so, this is a dystopia. <laughs> I'm, I'm so old. Oh, my God. But anyway, I'm still sitting here saying readers. And yeah. um, so <laughs> at any rate, there are companies that are just really, really good at this and that never uh, were, were, were never lapses. But, you know, having a uh, a lot of times companies get no attention and they hire the right marketing person who has a good relationship with the press and all of a sudden they start getting reviews again. And mm-hmm. I think so much of it has to do with that. And so, so little of it has to do with, in so many cases, a lot, it doesn't have that much to do with the gear. You know? Yeah. I mean, there are people that in this industry that could call me up and say, hey, could you review my whatever? And I probably would because I like the person and they've done good stuff in the past. And sure. there's people who, you know, there's probably two people that if they called me up, I wouldn't return their call because I've had extremely bad experiences with them in the past. Like maybe they threatened to sue me or something, um, which has happened. Well, I've only been sued once. Um, actually sued. I've been threatened many times. I've only been yeah. actually sued once. And that yeah. was by Pee Wee Herman. But long story. But anyway. Whoa. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to dig back into that one. Yeah, of these days. maybe we'll talk about that someday. But it's a funny story. But anyway, um, no manufacturer has actually ever taken uh, me or my employer to... to you know, to, to court. Um, it has happened with others though. So, um, but anyway, so I'm just going to say that the, the reasons that a reviewer d- does or does not review some brand or some product are many and varied. And I would say, honestly, I don't know about for you. I'll ask you, but I'll, I'll give my opinion first. Um, mm-hmm. With usually with me, it's just because they're not on the they're not on my radar or they fell off my radar. It's just I I just haven't you know with with so many people emailing me wanting reviews of their product, it's you know if you if you if you stop contacting me and you don't mm-hmm. show up at audio shows so that maybe we can have an interaction there, I might not find about out about your product. And a lot of times I'm looking through uh, forums and things like that. And I see products. I'm like, I, I never heard of this thing. And it might even be from a major brand and I could be completely unaware of it. Yeah. Yeah. And how about you? You know, for me, I think a lot of times, like everything you just said is, is, is relevant to my experience as well. But I think for me, a lot of times, one of the things that I'm looking for, especially in my role at Soundstage Access is... Generally speaking, I want to guide people to pretty sure bets, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think that's sort of sort of what Jeff was doing in this in this piece that that kicked off this whole thing, the the best loudspeaker brands for both luxury and performance. He wasn't trying to say these are the only brands that matter. What he was trying to say is, hey, man, if you're getting into this stuff, these brands you can bet this is a pretty sure bet, right? Yeah. This is, yeah. This is, these are gimmies. These are easy. Come on. And uh, you know, maybe it's a slightly different domain, but I'm trying to do the same thing is just to say, this is, this is a pretty safe bet. And so I'm often looking for those safe bets. I'm looking for those products that I know before I get them in, probably going to be really darn good. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to bring something in, that I just am pretty sure is going to suck. And, and I know <laughs> you, I know you do that because oh, you, do. <laughs> like to, you like to experiment around at the edges and, and that's, that's perfect for solo, but for access, I want to guide people. I don't want to write a bad review. I just, I, I want to, to point people in the direction of things that like, this is a pretty good place to spend your money or Hey, like if you got a little bit extra to spend, here's, 
here's something that's legitimately something you could spend more on. Maybe, maybe it doesn't give you measurable performance better than this other thing, but it's got this or this, this styling thing or this ergonomic feature or something like that. So that is a lot of what drives my decisions and what to review. Am I pretty sure it's going to rock? Yeah. If not, I'm less likely to bring it in, to be honest with you. So. See, I, I have to, I have to confess, I, I do like to, I do like to bring in things that I think might be a train wreck, but I know, but I do it in large part because since I run measurements, so many things from a measurement and technical standpoint are a train wreck, but I still mm. might like them. And those to yeah. me are the most interesting products to write about. And yeah, once in a while, it might be a train wreck from a measurement standpoint. And it's also a train wreck from a, a listening standpoint. <laughs> that happens. That happens a yeah. lot. And yeah. you know, usually if it's really bad measuring, it's not going to sound very good. Um, yeah. But, but th- you know, occasionally I, um, I find things that don't measure so great that sound or that have some kind of weird measurement anomaly. And yet I really like them possibly even because of that anomaly. So I'm looking for, look, I'm looking for fun stuff to write about. I mean, it's great to find a really good set of headphones. It sounds really good. And it costs, uh, you know, some reasonable amount of money. And I can write about that. And it's great. But I, you know, I would, I would rather write about, you know, the, the, the headphone equivalent of Ornette Coleman rather than the headphone equivalent of Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, amazingly, I understand exactly what you mean there. So you want to so, wrap it up? Yeah, man, let's wrap it up. You want to do some credits? Yeah, so I should say that the opening and closing music is by me, but the interstitial music, the bumper music, whatever you call it in radio podcast land, uh, mm-hmm. this this episode is by my good friend Terry Landry, a veteran L.A. studio musician and occasional touring musician and just all around great sax player and arranger. Yeah, and we should say we're part of the Soundstage Network. Um, I did the engineering and the recording. Am I going to do? Am I going to do the mixing and mastering this time around? Is yeah, that, I think it's kind of your turn. It's kind of your turn, and my dog needs to be walked right now. So uh, that's true. You know yeah. what? We need to come up with a collective name. Like, do you know? You know, Daniel Kwan and Daniel Shiner. They just refer to themselves as Daniels, so they don't have to say who did what. The, oh yeah, the, 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 the guys who directed everything everywhere all at once was just one of the best movies of the year so far. We should come up with a collective name for ourselves so we could just say mixing and mastering by brennis yeah we know there was like like i i just heard i was just listening to the um the hit parade podcast and they were talking about how uh which i didn't even know some combination of timbaland missy elliott and uh pharrell williams had some kind of a a joint production deal they were doing in wherever they were like virginia and uh i had no idea that i mean they were all such huge stars since then i did not know they were like part of a little joint collective that were banging out stuff out of a crummy little studio in virginia interesting before they became really famous and there there are a lot of other production teams like that as well so yeah well we should probably come up with something We've, we've uh, got two weeks to figure it out. We can, you know, we can yeah. talk in the back. And, and, we, yeah. and, we're, and we're open to suggestions as well. <laughs> Maybe you are. Drop, yeah. them, drop them into the comments section at the bottom of wherever you find this podcast. What have you done, Brent? <laughs> what have you done? All right. All right. Well, we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay.